Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the Adult Sunday School lesson for October 22nd, 2023. It's another New Testament lesson. This is from the uh, Gospel of Matthew, entitled Cost of Admission. This is uh, the fourth in a series of lessons entitled Invitation to the Kingdom. You know, uh, when Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God, uh, he stepped on some toes, but he provided some good news for lots of people. So uh, the Jesus movement in some circles is called the kingdom movement because he was te teaching about the kingdom of God. And uh, the kingdom movement works in tandem with the Baptist movement, of which Jesus was a part. And together, the work of John the Baptist for the Baptist movement and the work of Jesus in the kingdom of God movement brought forth a new understanding of the love of God. And uh, so that's what we are dealing with. We're exploring Jesus' invitation into the kingdom, how we can join the party through application of the truth contained in the parables that Jesus was teaching. We looked at the guest list from Matthew 21 and No Regrets, also from Matthew 21. Last week it was uh, Reponde s'il vous plaît, Please Respond, from Matthew 22. And today we are still in Matthew 22, but we're going to look at a, a, a reference uh, in the book of Isaiah an Old Testament scripture in a unit or a lesson that's called Cost of Admission. The next week we'll end in the unit as we end the month with uh, another parable from Matthew 22 augmented by uh, a scripture from the Old Testament book of Leviticus. So these parables tell of the kingdom of God, Jesus proclaiming the kingdom message, what our role in it is, and the character of the God who invites us into the kingdom. We understand from these parables that God has a plan of redemption for all humanity. Not just for part, not just for the good people, but for all humanity. Our evangelist is Matthew. We've been dealing with Matthew for these last four weeks, and in fact, uh, in the uh, in the lectionary, year A of the three-year cycle in the lectionary, uh, the uh, the Gospel of Matthew is featured prominently. So that's why we've been studying Matthew. We know that he was an apostle, a, a tax collector. I'm assuming that this is the same Matthew who wrote the Gospel, but it may, may not be. Because of his occupation, uh, tax collectors in general, and probably Matthew in particular, was despised by his own race because he was uh, in league with the, the Romans. Nobody likes to pay taxes. And uh, it was kind of a, not a job of good repute in ancient days. But uh, because of uh, his faithfulness and teaching and work as an apostle, he Matthew is venerated as a saint with the feast days in September and November in the Western Church and in the Eastern Church. The main point about the Gospel of Matthew is that uh, the Messiah has arrived, but most Jews don't recognize him and certainly no Gentiles at this point. So uh, he's a Messiah incognito. But better than the other Gospels, Matthew picks up where the Jewish Bible leaves off. So Malachi, the last book of the Hebrew Scriptures, closes with the promise of a Messiah, and Matthew declares that that promise is now fulfilled in Jesus. So that is the, the basic... Uh, point of view of the Gospel of Matthew. It's unique in that it has a nativity narrative 
relating to Jesus' birth, unique in that uh, it comes from Joseph's perspective, not Mary's. There is also a nativity narrative in the Gospel of Luke, which is more associated with Mary. And the Passion narrative in the, the book of Matthew contains many interesting and some would say strange episodes, such as the harrowing of hell when Jesus was in the tomb and reports of many resurrections. So the beginning of, of Matthew is different. The ending of Matthew is unique among the Gospels. And the text of Matthew goes a long way in showing how Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. In this unit, we're seeing that the religious leaders are challenging the authority of Jesus, and they are getting an earful. And uh, today is no different. They, they are going to get an earful uh, in, a, in a way that characterizes what a true Christian is. Up until today's text, the parables that we've been dealing with in Matthew 21 and 22, Jesus has been on the offense. They're questioning his authority, and Jesus is, is not, uh, not sparing their, their feelings by, by pushing back on, on how these Jewish leaders are, are hypocrites and that the lowly rejected people of Israel have more of a claim to the kingdom of God than these leaders do. But today we see the leaders on the offense. They're not just asking questions and posing genteel uh, conversation with Jesus. The, these religious leaders are, have rallied their own disciples and they've reached out to a political party called the Herodians in an effort to trap Jesus in his words, to, to show him uh, in disfavor and perhaps lead to his arrest. The, the Pharisees and their disciples and the Herodians, they're not friends. They're competing uh, groups within uh, the ancient times, but they are united in their opposition to Jesus. It's one of those deals with, where you're an, an enemy of my enemy, therefore you're my friend. Uh, and so they bind together hoping to uh, to trap Jesus but Jesus conquers them dramatically and brilliantly uh, in the uh, parable that we're going to look at today this parable this encounter some call the pinnacle of rhetoric there are many details associated with it I'll mention a, a couple of them but it really warrants serious word-for-word -word study because it contains a multitude of truth far richer than we can possibly look at in the few minutes we look at this lesson today. This episode, the question of uh, by the uh, Pharisees and the Herodians in the life of Jesus is found in four independent sources. This is significant. Mark knew of this encounter, and so he included it in his gospel. So uh, it, it would be known from that source. But it was also known in the sayings source, some called the Q gospel. You know, in addition to these narrative gospels that tell a story, there were gospels in the ancient times that include nothing but the sayings of Jesus. Jesus said this, Jesus said that. And uh, scholars have been able to reconstruct this so-called sayings gospel. They call it Q after uh, the first letter of a German word, Kella, which means source. It's a source used by Matthew and Luke as they rounded out or added details to the basic outline of Jesus' life included in the gospel of Mark. So Mark is one source independent of this Q gospel or saying source that, that uh, occurs in the gospels of Matthew and Luke. 
but it also appears in the Gospel of Thomas in a different context and also in another gospel not in the New Testament called Edgerton Gospel. These are all independent witnesses to Jesus saying. Those who uh, study the life of Jesus academically, not just religiously, place a great deal of credibility on multiple attestation to the sayings and deeds of Jesus. And so when you have four independent sources reporting the same thing about Jesus, uh, this goes a, a long way in identifying what is the essential aspect of Jesus. So we don't talk that much about it in Sunday school or church because we, we deal with the canonical gospels or those that are in the, uh, in the Bible, but historians and scholars unlike many in the church, consider all the reports about Jesus as worthy of study. So they look at many other Gospels which have come down to us, but which are not included in the canon of the Scripture. And uh, they use it as source information about uh, the life of Jesus. Many feel, both inside the church and those who study uh, the life of Jesus outside the church or ac academically feel that today's text along with the parable of the Good Samaritan essentially defines the life and ministry of Jesus. So if you want to ask the question what would Jesus do? WWJD you can look at the parable of the Good Samaritan for behavioral clues and guidance as to what would Jesus do. If you want to know how Jesus thought and felt, you can look at the parable today. I say that because as long-time Baptists, we have always felt that the lens by which you examine Scripture is Jesus. What would Jesus say and do in this situation? And so you cannot find a better example to answer the question, what would Jesus do? when you're asking that, what would his behaviors be and what would he think and feel than our text today and the parable of the Good Samaritan. So this is a significant and profound scripture that we're dealing with today. We're introduced uh, for the first time in Matthew's Gospel to the Herodians. This is a, a group of people who were followers of King Herod. You know, Everybody would, would want to be a king, and Herod was a king appointed or at least tolerated by the Roman authorities, and uh, he had uh, a clan or followers or sons and family who wanted to continue with that dynasty and, and continue in power. And uh, so there are various sources or competitors for who's going to be in control. Just like there are lots of political parties today. There's no shortage of people who want to be in charge. So the Herodians were a political party that have banded together with the religious sects of Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and maybe some others, uh, some zealots. The Herodians and zealots were more politically motivated in their opposition to Jesus. They did not tolerate, they did not like the teachings of Jesus. You may have noticed in these lessons this month in Matthew 21 and 22, it's Jesus versus the world. Everybody's against him. The dialogue and parables featured in this unit of study show how much the Jewish leaders feared and opposed Jesus. They didn't obey him. They thought he was dangerous. They didn't like him one bit. The Baptist movement, which was endorsed by Jesus, in fact, some say that Jesus became a disciple of John in, in part of, uh, during the Baptist movement, called forth repentance for people apart from temple. You know, that's why those people in charge of the temple the religious leaders didn't like the Baptist movement. They, they thought that it was blasphemy. They, they, were, uh, they were left out in the cold. 
And this idea of going across the Jordan River to be baptized is analogous to the uh, children of, of Israel escaping Egyptian captivity by crossing the Red Sea. And so it depicted a liberation from imprisonment or, or servitude that Rome looked at uh, with a, a, a jaundiced eye. They, they did not like the undercurrent of what the Baptist movement was, was teaching. And then comes Jesus with the kingdom movement proclaimed by Jesus and announcing forgiveness by God apart from priests and ritual. So the religious leaders of the day who ran the temple, ran the synagogues in charge of ritual uh, cleansing, they didn't like this idea that Jesus and John were presenting of being right with God apart from what they were teaching and doing. So these Jewish leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, their disciples who are mentioned today, and the Herodians, a political party, maybe the, uh, the Zealots, another political party, they were all united in seeking the death of Jesus. So it's going to be a hard go for Jesus after this. So let's read uh, the scripture. It's a trap. Matthew twenty-two fifteen through 18 says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Wow. So having failed at gentle Q&A, questions and answers, the Pharisees get serious and design a verbal trap using their disciples and a group of Herodians. They begin with flattery. Notice how kind they are we know you are sincere teach about god in truth you are impartial so they're setting him up they begin with flattery then ask a loaded question the question is is it lawful to pay taxes to caesar or not either way jesus answers that if he answered it with a yes or no response would be the wrong answer for some people if he answered that it was lawful, well, the people who were being abused by Roman authorities, they would uh, look at Jesus with disfavor. But if he said that it was illegal, not lawful to pay these taxes, then uh, that would be uh, not only blasphemous, but uh, that would be against the law. They would be... Uh, he could be held as a rebel, tried into courts for sedition. So you can see it's a it's a a hard uh, a hard question that they put to him. This question is posed slightly differently in these various versions. I mentioned that it appears four independent versions. Mark asks, in addition to, is it lawful? Should we give or not? Should we pay it or not? So. Here in Matthew, you can see that it's a hypothetical question. Is it lawful to pay the taxes? Whereas Mark, one of the characteristics of Mark's gospel, this is where if you compare and contrast the various episodes in the, in the gospels, you can get a slightly different image of Jesus. Mark has more of a straightforward, uh, not theoretical, but practical. Mark asks outright, should we pay the tax or not? It's not theoretical, but uh, practical. 
Here's a copy or picture of a denarius. Notice it bears an image, Caesar's image. Here are some Jewish coins. You don't see any images on the Jewish coins, do you? You know, in the, in the Jewish law and Jewish religion, it it's a sin to make God an image of God. So they did not like images at all. So the coins, the taxes that the religious leaders would levy and that you had to pay, you had to pay with these Jewish coins that didn't have a Caesar's image on them. Whereas the poll tax or tax that uh, was uh, levied by the Romans, they wouldn't accept these Jewish coins. They wanted coins of the realm, Caesar's coins. So you can see that being a money changer, uh, there was a, a definite role for that. Uh, earlier, an earlier lesson, we saw how Jesus became angry at the money changers who were disadvantaging the pilgrims and poor people, perhaps charging an exorbitant uh, fee for for merely changing from Jewish coinage to Roman coinage for temple or religious purposes or for taxation purposes. So you can see it's a complex issue. But Jesus recognizes it's a trap. He doesn't take the bait and answer with a yes or no. He questions their motive and rightly pegs them as hypocrites, just like the Pharisees. These Herodians and disciples of the Pharisees are in a league with the Pharisees. Matthew puts the question as hypothetical, but Mark further asks, should we pay it or not? Then think about it. You know, it may be okay to think that a tax is improper. I mean, you know, we all pay taxes and we don't like some of the taxes we have to pay. You know, when I was working in Indiana, I had to pay a, a, a tax, I call it a tax, to cross a bridge so I could go to work. I didn't like it, but I had to do it. I didn't refuse to do it. I didn't, uh, you know, it would be against the law not to pay it. You know, many people think some taxes are wrong, but it's criminal not to pay a tax that's legally binding. These, uh, these disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians wanted Jesus to say, that it's wrong, the tax is wrong, they shouldn't, they shouldn't pay it. But he wouldn't do that. Made in whose image? Let's read further. Verses 19 and to 22 say, Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. Oh, he best of them. What a, what a scene. Jesus asked to see a coin used for the Roman poll tax. It's a one that bears Caesar's image as I showed you before. And there would be different coins used for various taxes, including Jewish coins for the temple. They weren't asking about that. They were asking about the Roman tax. Evidently, the Roman denarius bearing Caesar's image and inscription was used for the poll tax that is, was required of all adults, male and female. Everybody had to pay this poll tax every year. But what a reply. Jesus, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. What an answer. Render, pay back to Caesar what is Caesar's. It's got his image and his inscription on it. Must belong to Caesar. But, as I said, Jews abhorred. They hated it was almost a sin to try to create an image of God. And what's more, back in those times, Caesar was considered divine. In fact, he was decreed as divine 
by Senate proclamation. So here Caesar, that the Roman authorities considered divine and a god, you had an image of God. This Roman coinage was would be terrible in the sight of uh, the Jewish leaders. So here's the question that's not asked, but is but it is assumed in this dialogue. And that question is, what in creation bears God's image? There are many things that bear Caesar's image. Do you know the answer to this? What in creation bears God's image? People, us, everybody, those that are created in God's image. So the unstated conclusion to the argument is give Caesar the materials that contains his image, but give to God all the people made in God's image. What an answer. No wonder they were dumbfounded and amazed. I, If this were contemporaneous, if Jesus just made that up on the spot, what a brilliant conclusion it was. He may have thought about it, or there may have been other episodes that dealt with this topic, and we have here in the gospel just a, a, a condensation of, of many similar episodes. But you couldn't get a more dramatic answer to a question than give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, Caesar, but give all the people to God. I mention this because Jerusalem, where this is happening, was destroyed at least twice. Once, before the Common Era, 587, when the, the Babylonians came and, and destroyed Jerusalem and took many people into exile in Babylonia, the Babylonian captivity, and now they're back during Jesus' time, but Jerusalem is going to be destroyed again uh, in 70 of the common era. And uh, when and in these parables, when Jesus is talking about throwing into darkness where they're weeping and gnashing of teeth, many people feel that uh, this is a reference or a premonition of uh, the destruction of Jerusalem that's coming in AD 70. Or... Maybe it's reading back into that after A.D. 70 when, uh, when the gospel was written. Wow, what, what a powerful uh, confrontation we're seeing here. I'm going to read an extended passage from Isaiah here, which adds further clarification to this. Seven verses, it's, it's quite lengthy, so, so bear with me. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. What? Cyrus? God's anointed? That word anointed is typically used of the Christ. But here in Isaiah, Isaiah 45, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, who is the king of Persia, the defeater of the Babylonians, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, and to strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. This is God talking to a Persian king named Cyrus. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I give you a title, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, which is the setting of the sun, 
that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Wow, what a, what a scripture. King Cyrus of Persia is called the Lord's Anointed, a title typically reserved for Christ. The gist of what I've read evidently indicates that anyone or anything may be used by God to accomplish God's purposes. God was not absent during the exile, but working behind the scenes to fulfill God's promises and intentions by bringing to pass the power of Cyrus who defeated the Babylonians and let the children of Israel return to the Holy Land from Babylon. God empowered this foreign king that was not a believer to accomplish these things. The gist of it is unlikely people are part of God's work. Shame on us for discounting them. Imagine King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord's anointed, who brought to pass blessings for Israel. If you look in 1 Peter 2.17, you can see that the early church took this scripture pretty literally. They took it to mean render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's, that we should uh, obey uh, our foreign uh, and political leaders. Give them what their due is. Honor all men. Love people of the faith. Here it's called a brotherhood, but it's not just the men. It's brothers and sisters. We fear in terms of reverence God and we honor the king. This is what we learn from the New Testament. Ethics of the early church were to fear and honor, to do service, to, uh, uh, to show reverence for God, and to show respect for those in authority in the political realm. So what are the issues for us today? Well, it's possible to twist Scripture to suit our own wishes as these uh, Herodians and Pharisees were attempting to do. We need to beware of flattery, disguising evil motives as they were flattering Jesus, trying to get him in a weak, in a, a weak moment to, uh, uh, to commit a crime that he could be arrested for. Simple Christian ethics. It doesn't get any more complex than this. Respect everyone. Every person is created in God's image. We're going to render to Caesar what Caesar's. We're going to render to God all people. So we respect everyone. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ in a deeper way than the respect we show for everyone. We fear honor, we fear God, obey uh, has the idea of uh, worship, uh, show deference to God in a different way than we love the brothers or other people, and we honor our elected officials. There is some scripture that says God is the one that grants them authority to, to conduct their role. Just as God empowered King Cyrus to accomplish God's motives, God may be empowering our local leaders, national leaders, world leaders uh, to accomplish God's goals. Uh, not only here, but worldwide. So respect, love, fear, and honor. Doesn't get any, any more complicated than that. 
And let's remember that sometimes God uses unlikely people and unlikely situations to accomplish God's purposes. Thank you for joining me today. Don't take me too seriously. There are lots of ways to interpret Scripture. Um, I'm giving you what I think uh, is a decent way to look at Scripture, not only from, you know, from a religious perspective, but also from an academic perspective based on what I've read through the years. Remember the prayer concerns of our church. That is one of the key things we get to do as a brotherhood or group of believers or fellowship of believers. We get to uh, lift up our concerns. And so let's, let's not fail to do that. And I hope to see you next week for the concluding lesson in this unit. They can't thank Daryl Elster enough for all he does to take care of us for worship experiences and for this, these lessons week by week for his uh, uh, engineering, audiovisual, AV support. Thank you so much, Daryl. Till next week, I say goodbye.